Hey, what's up? This is Natty P. I wanted to introduce this video uh, of a conversation my brother Jason Saab and I had with a gentleman named Xavier at the Arnold Classic uh, in March of 2020. Uh, what I want you to take away from this video is when you're out at an outreach and you see another, another Christian having a conversation with, with uh, someone, how do you enter into that conversation? You know, and, and this is a lot like uh, how to enter any conversation. Everyone, I'm sure, has had uh, an instance where they've been in the middle of a conversation and then somebody butts in, wants to know what you're talking about, and then they monopolize the conversation. So in evangelism, it's pretty much the same. <clears throat> because what you're doing is you're having a conversation with an actual person. And so when two actual people are having a conversation, you should um, be polite whenever you try to enter into this conversation. And uh, you don't always have to be invited, uh, just like in real life, but uh, there, there's uh, a manners. Use your, use your manners. My mom said, uh, good manners never go out of style. So that, that would be the first instance. And then whenever you get into that conversation, that evangelistic conversation uh, with another Christian and you're talking to an unbeliever, um, try to play off of each other. Um, sometimes there's a, it's an intangible thing, uh, but recognize whenever the thing that you are to say is, is actually necessary or, or would be beneficial to the conversation. And then if someone enters into your conversation, uh, you know work with what they put out there because you never know uh, where the conversation could take its turn in God's, God's providence. So that's, that's the first thing that I would like for you to pick up on. Uh, the next thing, uh, I'm really keen on this idea of expository apologetics. Uh, if you are looking for a good book on that, you could read the book called Expository Apologetics by Vody Bakum. Anyway, this is uh, probably one of my favorite methods of apologetics. Uh, is most realistic and I think is the most biblical. Um, so basically, it, it, I've talked about this on these videos before, but basically what you're doing is you're using the Bible to give an answer uh, when a question is asked. Now, uh, as is highlighted in that book, uh, the Apostle Paul even uh, didn't always do and a lot of times you read the book of Acts, you don't see people doing book, chapter, verse because they only had books. They didn't have chapters and verses back then. And so, so generally they maybe do a quote um, or, or, or uh, uh, refer to uh, one of the prophets or the law um, in, in their sermon. If you read, uh, uh, I think it is Acts 7. Stephen's speech, he's not quoting back in uh, Exodus uh, chapter 1, yada, 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 uh, or Genesis 15, this. He, he's just telling the story uh, from the Bible. So uh, you don't always have to book chapter and verse whenever you're trying to do, use the Bible for apologetics. Um, another thing that, uh, that Dr. Baca mentions in uh, his book is that in, in Acts 17, you see Paul use biblical concepts um, but he doesn't necessarily use the Bible. So he mentions uh, creation, fall, redemption, uh, judgment, and final, final es eschaton, as it were, uh, without actually quoting uh, the Bible per se, but he does use biblical concepts. So just because you're not quoting Bible verses doesn't mean you're not using this method. Um, basically what you're trying to do is use the Bible to give an answer. And so look for ways... That you see that in this video, some of it's book, chapter, verse, and some of it's uh, just reference, and other times it's uh, using biblical themes and truths. Um, so look look for that in this video. Uh, both myself and Jason do it. Um, also, uh, the final thing that I'll bring up is um, a good thing to be able to do. You can call this a sermon illustration, or uh, I just call it uh, talking about earthly things. Well, in John 3.12, Jesus says to Nicodemus, if I tell you of earthly things and you don't believe me, how will you believe me if I speak of heavenly things? So 
look in this video where um, something, the, my, maybe you'd call it a sermon illustration, but it's apologetics, so maybe it wouldn't be the same. It's where, where you take something that they're familiar with in nature or, or in life, and you, you use that thing that we're familiar with, that by God, God's common grace uh, we believe a certain way, and then use that as, as an illustration to explain a biblical truth. Uh, in much the same way that Jesus used uh, the wind blowing to explain regeneration in John chapter 3. So be on the lookout for those things in this video. Maybe you'll find more things that will be interesting to you. But if I was going to make a recommendation for this video, those three things would be what I'd like you to look for. In the first place, they can't turn to Christ and be saved unless the Holy Spirit enlightens them and helps them understand the gospel. You see, when you lay your head to pillow at night and you ask the question of who am I, where am I going, why am I here, that is your conscience trying to speak to you and trying to get the message of the gospel across to you. And the question is, will you listen to that small, still voice inside of you or will you continue to harden your heart I created and that 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 and what that means is that Jesus talked about the seed. He said the seed goes into the heart of a man. You know what's wrong with the You know what's wrong with the seed. You know what's wrong with the seed. You know what's wrong with the seed. This guy's not a murderer. This heart is a message. So he either goes into the heart for a period of time and then it goes away. He either becomes hardened to the message or he eventually softens his heart to the message. He straight up made a bet with the devil. That's a whole different story. The only way that's going to make you happy is he gave Satan permission to I need Christ as your Savior. Because even the devil was subject to God. You see, we're in an event today where people are trying to find happiness in the book in chapter the and verse where he made a bet. We're at an event where people are trying we're to find, find book chapter and verse. God didn't make a bet. He's God. He created everything. He's the owner of the universe. He's the owner of all. Jesus said the way you're going to be happy Since he created everything, it's impossible to say that he created hell. Absolutely he created hell. And hell is not hell because God's not there. Hell is hell because God is there, but he's there in his full exposure of his wrath against those who reject his son. You see, that's why it's so horrendous. When people reject Jesus Christ, you may tell me that there was no hell before Jesus. God created the heavens, the earth, and everything thereof. Hell is a result. Uh, he, he create, that is a place created for eternal torment for those that reject the offer of salvation that he offers for us. Or how to have what everyone is looking for. Happiness. How long has hell been there? And the answer is found in the first sermon that Jesus ever preached, which is the Beatitudes, which is what we just talked about. I don't know that the Bible says. It's one of those secret when things. You have a Beatitude attitude of brokenness over your sin. Before Jesus is so Before Jesus, there was Jesus is saved. Saved. Before Jesus there was Jesus there was saved. People in the Old Testament were saved God, in the same way we're saved today. But they were saved. The Bible says Abraham was kind of righteous by faith. So you're saying that everybody in the sky went to hell? Every what? The ones that didn't... They didn't trust the true God, Yahweh, yeah. The enemy of the Israelites. If they, didn't, if they bowed down to Dagon instead of Yahweh, then yeah, they went to hell. Yeah, absolutely. That's what the Bible says. Yeah. No, no, no. You're, you're confusing jealousy with envy. Yeah. Okay, so, so, you, are you married? What's your name? I'm Nathaniel. Xavier. Xavier has a good name. Uh, are you married, Xavier? Hell no. Have you ever had a girlfriend? Boyfriend or what? Let's just say friends with benefits. Be okay, okay. So you're friend with benefits, or 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 just say someone has a wife, or whatever, whatever you have it that's analogous to that. So should a should a man be okay with his wife going out and you know she goes up and flirts with every guy, has sex with every guy? Should a man be okay with that, or is it okay for him to be jealous? Cooking does exist. So. I'm not. A, I'm asking, is it okay? I'm not asking it, about a perversion. I'm asking, is it okay for him to be jealous? Is it a good thing that he's jealous? It's his wife. 
and the knife. Ooh. Ooh, that's he didn't say there was a third way. <laughs> this is actually easy. Because you want to justify I mean, your worldview. So no, it's not like that. Way. It's like, yeah, it on, the, on, on the whole, no. I'm not <laughs> saying that the it's, which, which one's not okay, the jealousy or the or the adultery? The adultery is not okay. And it's okay. Right, absolutely. There it is. And so when God says, I'm a jealous God, he says, he says that because God is the one, he's the husband. It refers to him as Israel's husband in the Old Testament, and then it refers to the church as Christ's bride in the New Testament. So when God says, I'm a jealous God, that means that he burns with envy whenever you go and, and worship anyone else. Because you, he's the one that you're supposed to love and worship. Does that make sense? I guess in a sense of way that does make sense. Yeah, so, so it's not like, it's not like uh, God sees you, you know, having a good day and he's like, man, I'm so envious of that guy. That, that'd be sinful. Like, God doesn't need your good day, first of all, because he created your good day. But, um, but his je jealousy means that, do you say did he? I mean, if we also have like free will, technically, are we like free to Okay, let me explain that one for you. So free will. Free will, the ability to do anything you want, doesn't exist. And I can illustrate that that principle from nature. If you go up and say, I'm going to use my free will to jump off this building, flap my arms, and fly away. Can you do that? Because you're not a bird and it's not in your nature to fly off the top of a building, right? So so with, with, with our free will, we have free will to do anything we want that's in our nature. And so whenever whenever Adam sinned, you asked about what Adam sinned. So whenever he sinned, it broke everything. It's like uh, it's like a cog that comes loose and the grandfather clock falls down and breaks everything. And so we're all born with this inherent sinfulness. We're guilty because he was our representative. And, but, but we're also born with this warped nature that is not naturally seeking God. So we can do anything we want. We can come to God if we wanted to, but it's not in our nature to want God. And so, so we 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 naturally want to sin. It's like it's like a dog, a, a, like a lion. If, if you put a steak and carrots before a lion and say it's your free will, you eat what you want. Except for I naturally don't want to sin. It's too much work. Well, I understand that. But honestly, think about it for a second. I mean, too much work to be grateful. That's just a Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So God, God calls that pharmacia, sorcery, smoking weed all the time. That's sorcery. Yeah, man, that's it. That's a sin. <laughs> Listen, let me ask you this. Here's what matters. Here's what matters. Xavier, what do you think is going to happen to you when you make your last breath? I'm going to hell straight up. Straight up. Straight up. Why would you want to choose destruction, a torment, a gnashing of teeth, where there's no quenching for the fire? Why would you want to cast your eternity in? you got breath in your lungs right now. Every breath you have, God's given you. And it's changed. Chance after chance after chance to confess him as Lord. Why would you want to spend your eternity? Yeah, remember you said you did. It is because it's an eternity. It's heaven or hell. The Bible says in Hebrews 9:27, it's appointed for man to die once, then comes to judge. But if you're in heaven, you're walking on eggshells because of it. No, 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 no. Here's the thing. Let, 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 let me give you, let, you know what the gospel is. Okay. Let, let me share the gospel. Okay. All the way back, Adam and Eve, they sinned. We talked about that. It broke everything. Sin entered the world. And every one of us, you and I and my friend Nathaniel, we're all marked by sin. Okay. God's standard for perfection is perfection. To stand before God and go to heaven, His requirement is perfection. Now, if you and I and Him and all of us, nobody can do that. That's why He sent Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the perfect Son, perfectly, never sinned. Okay? Now, when Christ came, He kept God's law perfect. You and I can't. James says if we've broken one law, we've broken them all. Think about how many lies you've told in your life. I couldn't count how many I've told in my life. We've still, you've broken one, you've broken them all. Look how perfect it is. But Paul says the law, Ten Commandments, the law is the schoolmaster that leads us to Christ. The law shows us that you and I can't be good enough. That's why Jesus came. And when Jesus lived, he lived perfectly for 33 and a half years. Perfectly. 
That's why you look in the Old Testament and you see sacrifice. Like exactly. Because none of the sacrifices satisfied God's wrath. But Christ came. When Christ came, he fulfilled all. And he was the one final sacrifice. He was perfect. He was fully God and fully man. He was fully man because man sinned against God. And he was fully God because only God could take the wrath of God into the body. And when Christ came, he goes to the cross. And on the cross, the Bible says that he who knew no sin became sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. God treated Jesus like you and I deserve to be treated. He looked down at Christ and our sins were imputed or laid upon Christ. And God crushed his son. Isaiah 53, 10 says, it pleased God to crush him. In exchange, Xavier, if we would turn in repentance and in faith and call out to God, his righteousness can be laid on us. Like our sin was laid on him, his righteousness can be laid upon us. And Christ completed that work. He says it is finished. The sin debt's paid for. They take his body off the tree. He laid in the tomb for three days. The third day he rose from the dead. And when he rose from the dead, it was a sign to the world that Jesus defeated sin, death, and hell forever. And as a child forever, he defeated it. As a child of God, that's your inheritance. That's why I'm, we, we don't want you to go to hell because your inheritance, if you come to Christ and you humble yourself and you call on the name to be saved, if you come to Christ, your inheritance, Xavier, is victory over sin, death, and hell. Unfortunately, unless you want to dig for me in the lot of the world, I'm like, no, 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 you're not. No, I mean, just for being black. So it's. it's what? Yeah, no, seriously. Let me educate you real quick. Let me educate you real quick. They're a liar. Let me educate you real quick. Let me educate you real quick. Let me educate you real quick. They're a liar, my friend. Let me educate you real quick. Actually, you guys are like the nicest people. Listen, let me educate you real quick. Racism and race is a modern construct. You and I have the same parents as Adam and Eve. We're of, there's one race, it's human race, that's it. The Bible talks about tribes, tongues, and nations, but it doesn't speak, and, and the race is the way this, this country is built. Listen, the only difference in us is the amount of melatonin in our skin. Mel that's it. No, no, melatonin, that's what you take. Melanin. 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 Sorry. <laughs> I had one of those energy drinks. Maybe it is working. <laughs> but, but, but that's the only difference. That's it. That's the only difference. Because you and I, when we take our last breath, listen, we're going to stand before God. That's why the gospel is a message of equality. Because no matter black, white, yellow, red, ain't none of us good enough to go to heaven. That's why Christ came. And that's why the Bible says he's our intercessor. He's our mediator. So if you turn to Christ and you call on Christ, Xavier, listen, it doesn't matter what color your skin is. It doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter where you've been. What matters is what did you do with Christ? That's the most important thing you can do with your life is what you do with Jesus Christ. And if you come to Christ, when you take your last breath and you swing out into eternity and you stand before God, He doesn't see Xavier as the wretched, sinful, vile person that we all are, that you are, but He sees Christ in front of you. He sees Christ's perfection, Christ's righteousness, Christ's goodness, Christ's perfection. And he says, well done, my good and faithful servant. He welcomes you into heaven to worship Him forever. You're not walking on eggshells. You're a son of the King and you're worshiping forever. But if you reject this message, you'll hear the opposite. When you stand before God, He'll say, depart from me, you worker of lawlessness. I never knew you as He cast you, yes, into hell. And all creation cheers because God has rid this world of your existence because you reject the Son. So, so that's the precipice. That, that's where you're at. You're not beyond this. Listen, there's more mercy in Christ than sin in you. But you got to come to God God's way. Not, not Xavier's way. Not my way. Not his way. God's way. Which is through the cross of Christ. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. And I am the life. He says, and no one comes to the Father except through me. So what I just explained to you about Christ going before you, that's how you come to God. Remember how you said it, it? It's a lot of work to sin. It is a ton of you. So, so, so think about this too, because we come to God to get saved from God, to to go dwell with Him and make our, our communion with Him in, in everything, right? But the Bible also promises that He who began a good work in you will can com complete it. So God keeps working on us, and and the Christian will sin less and less over time. And in in the pro great promise of the Bible is eventually. God makes an end to sin, so when we're in His presence, we'll never sin again. Not, not in the least, right? 
like because he'll remove it he'll he'll clean clean up the place right but for those that go into hell there's a very real aspect to that they're not they don't have that same promise so all they're going to be able to do because God's grace has been removed and his restraint on their sin has been removed all they're going to do for all eternity is sin and sin and get worse and worse what's that well um, he sends sinners to hell so so a hacker if you're breaking into somebody else's stuff that'd be like trespassing probably what if they stole your stuff first he says vengeance is mine uh, I don't know man uh, I, I don't know how to parse all that out uh, uh, that's a I'm asking for a friend okay yeah I mean I don't know how to I mean if it, if, if what you're doing is sinful so if it's like trespassing or, or stealing or one of those kinds of things um, or, or even taking your own vengeance I mean that that God has said not to do so can you trespass on um, I'm sure you could. So, so one of the things. <laughs> I don't know, man. That's one of the things that we tend to do as creatures is we try to see, like, we try to make lists of rules as creatures, pe- c- c- human beings. Is, is we try to make lists of of what can I get away with? So, so like the the the. Um, the, the human being will say, well, what, what exactly is lying or how much do I have to tell the truth so that I'm not lying? And that's what we do in our natural state. We try to see what we can get away with. But, but whenever God changes our hearts, instead of trying to see how far we can go without breaking the commandment, we try to figure out how do we keep this commandment. So instead of thinking, how do I not lie? We're thinking, how do I tell the truth? What, what's another way that I can tell the truth and keep the commandment against lying? You know what I mean? Well, thank you very much. So here's the thing. Here's the thing. I'll leave you with one thought. So anyway, so when you come to Christ, okay, there's not a magical ceremony or thing you do. Listen, what you need to do is a quiet, this is wherever. You don't have to be a church, be your apartment, your house, wherever. Sit on your face before God. Cry out to God for mercy. The Bible says all who call in the name of the Lord will be saved. But God knows the heart and God tests the mind. So he knows if Xavier's coming for a get out of hell free card, or if you're coming because you're broken against the one you know who hit you in your mother's I, I understand both. And when you, when you come, he hit me. Listen, listen, he hit you. He made you. Listen. And then he says, listen, when you, when you come to that, the Bible, it's called regeneration. It's called being born again. And God gives you a new heart, new desires, new affections. You turn to God in repentance and in faith. To repent means to turn away from the things of this world, turn to God, and to believe on Christ and who He is and what He's done. Okay? Now, I'm going to give you this a gospel track. It's just a gospel message. Listen, if you have any other questions, you can either search that on Facebook or just go to the website and get a hold of me. Say, hey, this is Xavier. I talked to you at Columbus, whatever. And I'll, be, I'll answer any questions I can. I'll pray for you, whatever you need. Just give me a shout. All right? Would you at least think about it? Do you got a Bible at home? Yeah, you got a Bible? Okay. My dad always told me keep that where you can get at it, alright? Keep it handy.